So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Queen's University is situated on Anishinaabe and Hudsonone territory. Concordia University, which is my university, is located on unceded and indigenous lands of the Kanegahaga Nation. When someone mentions violence in Mesoamerica, the first images that usually jump to mind are the screaming victim held down by priest as his chest is broken open and his still beating heart removed to satiate the appetite of some gruesome god. Uh, we think of the wars between Mayan kingdoms and Aztecs against the invading conquistadors. The empires that grew in the basins and plateaus of ancient Mexico were seemingly watered by blood. And I'm not going to deny that, uh, viol that violence didn't happen. It, it did. Um, but you also have to question why and in what ways that violence was actually employed. So I do, I'm doing so by looking at Monte Alban and how they used visual representations of violence and death in their danzantes reliefs as a tool of demonstrating their control over far-flung populations that were now subservient to a disembedded capital. By showing violence so openly at a site where there would be representatives of these defeated peoples and possible political allies, Monte Alaban was enacting a violence in and of itself, the threat of domination and the promise of subjugation to their regime. So Oaxaca is the home of the Zapotec people, historically and today. Uh, most settlements were scattered about the valley in floor in loose villages. In some sites, larger civic ceremonial centers uh, sprung up. But Monte Alban stands apart from these earlier formations for four specific reasons. So first of all, it had a really abrupt appearance around 500 BC on a really unlikely slope of steep hilltop where Whereas most, most of the civic ceremonial centers were, again, located on the valley floor where it was easier to build up and get access to materials. So two, because it's located up on the top of a mountain, it had no real way of conceivably producing food for the population it suddenly had. So they had to rely on trade to survive, which is unlike anything that came before it. And third, when I mean they had a population suddenly spring up, I mean that nearly a third of the valley's population of 8,000 to 10,000 people were living at this one site. And number four, uh, according to Blanton and Al, quote, no other site in the valley had a ceremonial concourse and public architecture as large as Monte Alban's, and only Monte Alban had a Danzante's gallery, end quote. So you're going to learned throughout this presentation that I love Richard Blanton, and he was my advisor in undergraduate, which would tell you something about why I love this. Um, so he was the one who termed the idea of a disembedded capital, a ruling city-state within a network of subjugated centers, more specifically, uh, in this case, four tiers of bureaucratic governance over 155 settlements within the valley and the hinterlands. So, Let's putting this simply into Western conceptions of civilization, Monte Alban was an empire in the valley, and it had a range of about 275 kilom kilometers, or 179 miles, which you can see on that map. That's the radius of, of import it had for foodstuffs alone. It reached farther than that in the later centuries, uh, going as far as Teotihuacan in the classic period. But that kind of presence did not come without resistance. Monte Alban would need an impressive military to bring such far-slung centers under its control, and the site was proud to show its power. However, focusing on military numbers or ability neglects that there are many means of conquering, of dominance, of violence. So that's where I come in as an art historian. Uh, art, I see art as an underused and often dismissed source of archaeological and anthropological information. As I have argued extensively, art is not, nor has it ever been, a passive reflection of society. It's an active agent in creating and contesting ideology and the institutions it represents. So I'm going to uh, demonstrate this through the analysis of the Danzantes as a form of violence in an interconnected world of pre-classic Mesoamerica. So the Danzante Wall is uh, located on Building M in the main plaza of Monte Alban. Uh, it was built within the first stages of occupation at the site. 
so around 500 BC. Thank you. Uh, over 300 Danzantes have been found in catalog around Monte Alban. In terms of visual corpus, that means they make up 80% of the some visual culture at the site. And all of them can be linked to this initial phase of occupation. And that's, that's not a skewed figure due to lack of trying to find more. That's a deliberate choice that needs to be pursued. The main plaza was more than a marketplace. It was a stage for propagating societal ideology, keeping order within the center that would radiate outwards towards the networks of trade and conquest. The Zanzante wall was a massive visual statement in the open main plaza as it would be visible to a majority of the residing population as well as any of those who were passing through. So one of the reasons for this violence is for ritual purposes, which is usually a catch-all term in archaeology for we don't know exactly what it was for, but it was really important. Uh, luckily, we do know a bit here. Um, <laughs> these images could be involved in the sacrificial complex that seems to be ubiquitous across Mesoamerica. These monuments, therefore, could represent a figurative sacrifice to the gods while simultaneously providing a very dramatic backdrop for the performances. But by far the most popular interpretation of the Danzante Wall is a record of subjugated colonies through the representation of slain war trophies. Um, this interpretation is also supported by a second monument at Alt Monte Alban, uh, Structure J, which dates to the following Monte Alban II phase, which is 100 BC to uh, 280, because it lists, it, it, it basically lists subjugated uh, regions, cities, groups, that could be linked to the Danzantes. Um, but the last notion uh, that I want to look at is the notion that art as violence, that a depiction of violence is itself violence. If art is an active agent within this network of relationships between commoners, elites, foreign persons, citizens of Monte Alban Empire, and recognizing that such relationships are a reality in and of themselves, then we're led to the conclusion that the depiction of violence is itself an act of violence that art inflicts upon the subject and the audience. I build this idea off of an understanding of how art is used to convey power, only in this case, also giving special attention to the converse depiction of subjugation. Um, it's beneficial to frame this notion with uh, Kernick's explanation of a process of violence, quote, as symbolic violence also serves to create subjects, but in a way that's perceived as more humane and that occurs when overt violence must be concealed and the real basis of authoritative relationships masked. Symbolic violence is thus a way of establishing and preserving unequal relationships in a more socially acceptable manner, end quote, which is something you could see at a, play, at a disembedded capital such as Monte Alban that has to maintain order over such a large valley. And although this violence is labeled as symbolic, and that it's conveyed through visual cues rather than through physical attack, the power created and projected by the stones is quite real. This is um, categorized as coercive power, which involves, quote, the use of threats and force by elites to compel non-elites to cooperate and provide resources. The threat can include potential physical harm or the withholding of critical resources, end quote. The Desantes not only promise death, but utter defeat for the city you fight for. Anyone who sees these stones would recognize the threat inherent in its display. In both of these cases, neither violence or power are simple actions or dichotomies. It's a dynamic matrix of relationships that require participation of several actors. An act of violence must itself have a victim, just as visual culture must be recognized by another, in, another actor in order to exist. In this manner, the viewer becomes the victims of violence inflicted upon the monument. Here, Art was used to not only display the results of combat then, but also as a form of violence in and of itself. These images are meant to discuss, meant to horrify. It would be simple to call the overt display of violence at Monte Alban savage or excessive. That's not overkill. That is a warning. That is a promise. The Dazante Wall of Monte Alban says, look at all the groups that tried before you. Look at what we did to them. Look at how we obliterated them, humiliate them, cut them down, and dice them up. Look at them and do the smart thing. Don't try. And it did so without uttering a single word. Thank you.
gives a one side, one side of authority, and um, really parses it for meaning. So I'm going to um, comment on three things that can potentially happen in this paper. Number one, it's a, it's a big, big commentary on museumization of Mesoamerican cultures, uh, seeing them as native, uh, ancient, and, and um, this, this sort of reducing them to territories, like untouched native territories and all of that, all of that. Like you have this brilliant thing of saying, no, they are very active, they're very non-stagnant cultures, they're, they're trading, they're, they're going out of their way to display their power, and they're humans, they are not plants and animals and native people. Okay, uh, the other thing is the use of landscape. Landscapes of power, structures of authority, mm, and, and, and you can really do a lot with the way um, hilltops or the way that entire uh, structure is placed, um, how that speaks back to the use of, of uh, monuments and, and, and the use of physical landscape to, to depict power. And um, finally, commemorating violence. Now, the, obviously the piece is a very, the, uh, is, is a very disturbing piece to look at, it's disgusting as um, you sort of described, and it's supposed to have that effect of, 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 of numbing you and like uh, making you a docile um, citizen. Um, but uh, it can also have the opposite effect of saying, screw you, I'm going to try it anyway. So, yeah, that's my comment. And uh, <laughs> we can sort of take it there because you're uh, living in my place, so I can sort of just keep talking to you about this. Okay, stop talking. All right. Um, <laughs> Is that all right, Catherine? Great. Um, should, I, should I start? Chair? Okay, let's just start you okay, great. To respond to your your first point about <coughs> how it, you know there is systemic violence within the area, and I am looking at how art is brought into the service of the state. However, the idea that art wasn't being used by the state beforehand is not true. It, it's always been that way. Um, but looking at it as a depicting violence and in some ways enacting violence to prevent further violence is something definitely to tease out within the paper. Um, because in so, we don't know exactly what the Danzante wall was actually used for. We, we, we can't talk to the people that live there. They're very much dead. Um, but in, in looking at it as more of a threat than a record is something that I can look into and can incorporate into the paper. Um, the second question you have is, that, you know, is, is this type of uh, violence in art or art as violence used anywhere else? Um, in terms of the danzantes, they are only found at Monte Alban. There's been only one figure similar to it found outside of the site, and that's at San Jose Mogot, which is uh, the capital that pre predated Monte Alban. And it, there are uh, several scholars who um, believe that the, one of the reasons for the population boom at Monte Alban was that the elites from San Jose Mogot just moved over there. Um, but this exact form is not seen anywhere else of just depicting war captives in such an overt manner like as, as, as a form of record keeping. Um, there are murals uh, depicting war and the aftermath of war but never just the victims uh, just plastered onto the walls. It's always given a context of the outcome of a battle or something that's in the process of being done. Um, so that, that sets it apart. Yeah, and that, that is the most attractive part of this paper because if you see these guards outside Buckingham Palace, they're performing the same pur purpose if you can think about it. But it's not the victim, it's the oppressor who is preventing the others from coming into the palace. But here you are showing the example of those who are defeated or will be defeated if they transgress. And that remains a unique example and quite a friend of project if you had some. Um, I'm Stab uh, Sites. Yeah, I have a question for you, Catherine. Um, and it's yeah, coming from a place where uh, I don't know anything about Mesoamerican um, history or culture, but from my experience um, in the Canadian context, looking at groups like the Haudenosaunee or the Wendat, where torture is seen as part of a larger ritualistic process in which the victim is exalted through the process. Is there any conversation about how these might be markers of individuals who have, for example, sacrificed or participated in the sacrifice that was seen as beneficial for these communities? Or has it always been seen?
assuming that none of these participants were in any way willing, and therefore this is a violence of a kind of terrifying order as opposed to the ultimate sort of sacrifice. And, and certainly Christianity has its own relationship with that too. And I just wondered if that's ever part of the conversation. That's actually one of the paragraphs I had to skip over because I was really kind of dying. Um, but yeah, um, in, in some ways, uh, self-sacrifice um, and sacrifice itself is seen as something that, yeah, it is an honor, but I mean, when you're the person up there and it's not your choice, uh, that's the thing with the war captives being sacrificed is, it wasn't our choice to be here. Like, there's, there's a slight difference. I mean, it's still a position where they would recognize, okay, well, I mean, I'm it's still gonna be doing some good. I mean, um, like, it's, survival has a cost and they recognize this and that from these deaths from those who suffered um new life is possible because they're satiating the gods um but yeah there it there's still they carry this notion of they weren't quite as willing as it would be for somebody who who did so willingly that's why they're shown splayed out in these, you know, the, these contorted positions. They're shown naked and mutilated. Like, there's nothing graceful, there's nothing noble about how they're being depicted. 